Welcome to the first section in Equipment Service by Scuba Educators as taught by Scientific Diving International. Today we're going to be talking about high pressure scuba cylinders. Scuba diving is only possible with both high pressure cylinders and reliable regulators. And by definition of the U.S. Department of Transportation, a cylinder is a transportable vessel that for our purposes will contain compressed gas and that exerts a pressure of greater than or equal to 40.6 pounds per square inch absolute at 20 degrees Celsius. The first high pressure cylinders were manufactured in the United States around 1902. Compressed gas cylinders are considered hazardous material and in the United States their use and transport comes under the authority of the US Department of Transportation DOT. In Canada HAZMAT comes under Transport Canada or TC. Employees that handle or transport compressed gases as part of their work duty must be trained in hazardous materials awareness. Only seamless cylinders are permitted for high pressure gases in the United States. Let's talk about composition and construction of cylinders. Scuba cylinders can be made of alloys of steel or aluminum and these alloys are specified by the US Department of Transportation. There are also two types of composite cylinders approved for use in scuba. Although I've never seen one for sale anywhere, nor have ever seen one in use. Now, somebody pointed out to me that there is one for sale on the internet, but we can talk about the ups and downs, pros and cons of a composite cylinder. Composite cylinders are made from a thin layer of aluminum or plastic wrapped with carbon fiber and then wrapped again on the outside with uh, fiberglass and epoxy. So it makes a much lighter cylinder. But let's concentrate on, on metal cylinders because those are the ones that we will see in the marketplace and in use in the United States. Aluminum cylinders are all made from one alloy, which is called 6061T6. So it's a particular alloy the metals are specified by DOT. The T6 is the tempering level. So after formation of the cylinder, they temper it. We're going to talk more about that later. And aluminum cylinders all bear the DOT permit 3AL. For an aluminum cylinder to be legal to fill in the United States, it must be carry the, that number and letter combination 3AL. 3AL cylinders begin life as machined, a machine slug that is placed in a hydraulic press and die and squeeze to form an open-ended cup. If you link, if you take this link that's on this slide and uh, enter it into your browser, you can see a YouTube video showing the, the uh, manufacture of aluminum 3AL cylinders. The opened end of the cup is swaged or squeezed using a second die and press into the tapered end that we're used to seeing in a scuba cylinder. The cylinders are then heat tempered. That's where the T6 comes in. The neck is shaped and machined to create a place for the neck O-ring and then the neck is tapped to accept the valve. Next comes the hydrostatic test where the cylinder is filled with water and placed in a water filled steel jacket. Pressure is applied at five thirds the service pressure, which is the, the service pressure is the maximum pressure that the cylinder is legally uh, allowed to be filled to. And in, during the hydrostatic test, the cylinder must not expand beyond an allowable expansion volume. So the volume is me measured before and after expansion. And if it expands too much, it fails. If the cylinder passes, the Department of Transportation code will be stamped into the cylinder neck. And aluminum cylinders have service pressures of 3000 PSIG, but 
100 cubic foot cylinders have service pressures of 3300 PSIG, pounds per square inch gauge. Cylinders may be left rough or raw after a manufacturer. They may be sanded to appear brushed or they may be powder coated with paint. Steel cylinders can be made from a number of alloys and range in service pressures from 2400 to 3089 PSIG, which are considered low pressure cylinders, up to a maximum pressure of 3442 PSIG, which are considered high pressure cylinders. Older low pressure steel cylinders had service pressures ranging from 1600 to 2250 PSIG, and a few were made that had 3000 PSIG as their working pressure or service pressure. Each steel alloy is either permitted by DOT, in which case the permit doesn't expire till DOT says it does, or has a special permit that must be renewed. And we'll talk more about that later. If you own a cylinder that has an expired permit and the permit has not been renewed, it cannot be filled. Steel cylinders begin life as a flat disc that's approximately a quarter inch thick. If you take this web address and put it into your browser, you can see the Faber factory in Italy and the manufacturer of a steel cylinder. The disc is drawn into a cup shape using hydraulic ram and dies. And then the open end of the cylinder cup is trimmed and heated and a spinning lathe forms the shoulder and neck area, resulting in a closed end. The cylinders are then heat tempered and tapped to accept the cylinder valve. The cylinder is shot blasted inside and out and then hydrostatically tested. If the cylinder passes the hydrostatic test, the DOT code is applied, and then the cylinders are processed in one of several ways. They could be coated externally in zinc, which is called hot dipped galvanization, or they could be, they could be painted using a zinc rich primer and epoxy top coat. Cylinders are made in volumes of two to 130 cubic feet there are a few that are larger than 130 cubic feet. And in the United States, the cylinder capacity is the amount of gas in cubic feet at sea level that is compressed into the cylinder. This, may, this number may or may not be completely accurate. You have to check with the manufacturer to see if they round it up or down on that number. But the only real accurate way to calculate gas volume in a compressed gas cylinder at maximum service pressure is to know the liquid volume and multiply that by the service pressure in atmospheres, which is what they do in Europe and what the US military does. Three AL cylinders typically have service pressures of 3000 PSIG at 20 degrees Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit, and may not be overfilled. Remember that there are a few aluminum cylinders that have service pressures of 3300 PSIG. Low pressure steel cylinders have service pressures of 2400 to 3089 PSIG at 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit and may be overfilled by 10% for the first five years, signified by a plus after the first hydrostatic test date. The plus may be renewed if the hydrostatic retester does certain calculations, but they rarely do. So the owners of low pressure steel cylinders lose the 5% overfill, 10% overfill after five years. High pressure steel cylinders have service pressures of 3442 PSIG and are not permitted to be overfilled. Codes stamped into the cylinder neck Define the authorizing body, which is Transport Canada or DOT, US DOT. Sometimes in North America we see TC slash DOT, meaning both agencies have approved the material and the make of the cylinder. That's followed by the material code. In other words, steel or aluminum, and there are different codes. 
for a lot of steel cylinders. And then the cylinder service pressure in PSIG in the United States or BAR in Canada. The second line of code lists the cylinder serial number, the manufacturer code, and the first hydrostatic test date, which is month and year, and the tester's symbol is in the center of the month and year. And sometimes it's a, uh, a little icon, and sometimes it might be uh, a couple of initials. So let's look at some of the code that you find on a, on a typical scuba cylinder. So let's start with the aluminum. DOT, we'll just stick to DOT for now because we're in the United States. So DOT 3AL, that's the only code allowed for aluminum in the U.S. 3000 PSIG is the working pressure or service pressure. Second line, we have the serial number. We have the manufacturer, which is Luxfer. And then we have the hydrostat first hydrostatic test date, which was 01 of 2008. And there's a code in the middle. I just put a triangle there. And then the on looks for cylinders, they're scuba cylinders. You see an S followed by the uh, volume of the cylinder. So it would be a scuba 80 cubic foot cylinder. Low pressure steel cylinder, Department of Transportation, the material code is 3AA, which stands for chrome moly steel. And the working pressure or service pressure in this case is 2,250. This is an older low pressure cylinder. The modern low pressure cylinders are typically at 2,400. Uh, and then we have the serial number in the second line and the manufacturer, the little triangle or the diamond rather with the N in the center stands for Norris, Norris Industries. And then we have the first hydrostatic test date. Again, was tested by Norris and that date was five of 1974 and it had a plus for the first five years. So it was allowed to be overfilled for five, at, at 5%. For high pressure steel cylinders, there are a number of uh, codes, num numerical codes, um, and this is just one that happens to be in existence for now. Um, this is Department of Transportation, uh, and the code is E, which stands for exemption. Sometimes you'll see a P SP, special permit, but exemption 13488, followed by the service pressure or working pressure, which is 3442 PSIG, followed by the serial number, followed by the first hydrostatic test date, 0506. On the second line, we have the manufacturer, Faber. The REE, which is the expansion allowance. So it, it can expand by 67 cubic centimeters during the hydrostatic test. If it expands more than that, it fails. And then the final thing is on this cylinder would be the test pressure, 5250. Now high pressure cylinders are not tested at five thirds of the working pressure, they're tested at three halves or one and a half times. So that's why this number is a little bit lower than you might expect. Scuba cylinders must be tested hydrostatically every five years by DOT law. If the DOT uh, hydrostatic test date has expired, it is illegal to fill the cylinder. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The hydrostatic test expires on the last day of the month in which the test was performed in. The retester must stamp a passed cylinder with the date and their retester number. So if the cylinder passes hydrostatic test, the, the retester would stamp a code on the cylinder that indicated who the retester was. And of course the new hydrostatic test month and year. If a cylinder has an expired hydro stamp and is inadvertently filled, somebody filled it by accident, they didn't look, 
The fill filler can be fined by DOT $10,000. If the filler knows that the cylinder has an expired hydrostatic test date and fills it anyway, they're subject to a fine of $15,000. Cylinders must also be visually inspected inside and out every five years by DOT law. And we're thinking, wow, the dive shop makes me in have my cylinder inspected annually. Yes, that's an industry standard. The law is every five years, the industry standard, which is safe, is at least once a year. DOT at one time allowed the aluminum alloy 6351T6. It's a different comp composition of aluminum. And that alloy was allowed to be used to produce cylinders. The reason for that was the 6351 alloy was a little bit more resistant to corrosion, but it turns out that it's also a little bit brittler. And so over time, they have a tendency to develop cracks. Now this alloy is no longer be used, been being used to manufacture aluminum cylinders, but there are still cylinders in use that were made from this alloy. So as a result, DOT specifies that they must have their neck area tested using what's known as an eddy current detector. The eddy current detector sends out a non-destructive uh, pulse of plasma, which is used to detect minuscule cracks that may not be visible to the inspector. The visual inspection conducted by dive shops on scuba cylinders is not a law, as I said, but an industry standard and a really good idea. Dive shops require at least annual internal and external inspections. And depending on the shop, the annual inspection may expire on the first or the last of the month listed on the previous inspection. This is what's called an evidence of inspection sticker. A lot of people call it a visual sticker uh, and, and that's okay. It's, but really, honestly, it's just an evidence of visual inspection. And it's gonna tell us the month and the year in which the visual inspection was done. There's some other information on there in case we get into things like nitrox. It, it could be oxygen compatible. If it was an oxygen cylinder, it would say oxygen clean. And if it's an aluminum cylinder that was tested using the eddy current device, we could indicate that the eddy current testing was done on it and that it passed. As I said before, compressed gas is considered a hazardous material by the US DOT and by Transport Canada, and internationally, of course. In the US, if you transport more than 999 pounds of hazardous materials as part of a business, it requires that you have proper paperwork to transport that amount of gas. And that includes the um, manifest and emergency plan. And also you must train your employees and placard the cargo. And this is an example of placarding. The one on the right is the um, international version so that would be recognized all around the world and that's what the United States and Canada have gone to in the last few years so these you'll be seeing newer hazmat diamonds on on a vehicle and in the case of placarding the vehicle must be placarded on all four sides any employees that handle or transport any amount of hazmat must be trained by their employer in hazmat awareness so if you're interested, contact the instructor, take the Scientific Diving International Hazmat for Cylinder Handlers and Compressed Gas Cylinder Fillers if you need it. Let's talk about maintenance. Cylinders should not be handled roughly. They contain a large amount of explosive force. Keep cylinders at temperatures of less than 130 degrees Fahrenheit Store cylinders either completely full or nearly empty. And we'll talk more about why that is next week with the valve, but it really has a lot to do with, with fire. 
because if a cylinder overheats and explodes, it's going to cause a big problem because of the explosive force in it. And if you keep it completely full, there's a, a burst disc in the valve that's, that will, will relieve when the pressure gets too high as it's heating up uh, before it explodes. And if it's nearly empty, it's not going to do much when it heats up. Rinse your cylinder after pool and saltwater dives, including the valve orifice, and then blow the water out afterwards. Have the cylinder valve serviced every five years. So when you do a hydrostatic test on the cylinder, have the valve serviced. Have it taken apart and cleaned. If anything needs to be replaced, do it at that point. Change the burst disc. We'll talk about that next week. Lay the cylinder down when not under supervision. Don't want a cylinder to be knocked over, potentially hitting somebody, something, potentially hitting the valve on something and breaking it off. That would be very dangerous. So let's talk about what kinds of things we can expect to see in a field type operation. We're on a dive or we're at the pool. You get a leak. Where's the cylinder valve combination going to be leaking from? There's a couple of places that are pretty standard. The first one would be the neck O-ring. And this is fairly rare, but it could happen, especially if you're in a, in a situation where you're diving in a lot of salt water and the cylinders aren't cleaned as, or rinsed as well as they should be. What happens is salt water will creep onto the O-ring that lies between the valve and the cylinder and it'll dry and the more salt you get build up the uh, easier it is for that neck o-ring to start leaking it could also leak because it's old and compressed you know and when we change the uh, do a visual inspection we typically would replace that neck o-ring but some people don't do that and so uh, an o-ring that's supposed to be round in cross section may end up being uh, squished down and square and it may start leaking so that would be one place. The other would be the orifice O-ring, the O-ring that goes between the regulator and the cylinder valve. The valve stem. If you see bubbles coming out of the hand wheel that we use to turn the cylinder valve on, then there's a leak that's coming down the shaft of the, the valve stem itself. And then the burst disc assembly. It is possible that if you could see a small amount of leakage from the burst burst disc assembly. The neck O-ring is something that we cannot repair in the field. You must take it to the dive shop, tell them what's going on, and they'll service it. It means taking out the valve, cleaning things, you know, sometimes even cleaning the surface of the cylinder where the O-ring is seated. The orifice O-ring, the O-ring, that's the one we're commonly looking at because it's the one that seats between the regulator first stage and the cylinder valve face. If we got a leak there, replace the O-ring. They're cheap. We carry spares in our dive master kit and a pick so we can take the old one out. And that's a pretty simple fix. And those things will will fail before too long. So always carry spares. If you see bubbles coming from the hand wheel, so it's leaking down the valve stem, the only thing you could possibly do is tighten the bonnet nut. The bonnet nut is the thing that holds the whole valve stem assembly in place on the valve. And I would say just tighten it gently. If it doesn't work, then you're not going to be able to fix that kind of leak in the field and the valve needs service. Which in involves relieving all the pressure from the cylinder, taking the valve completely apart, which we're going to do when we get into the hands-on portion of this course. And then you can see all the components and what could possibly leak inside a cylinder valve. Then the burst disc, which is an emergency uh, safety measure. Basically, if the cylinder gets too hot, the burst disc is designed to fail as the pressure gets too high. And if you see a tiny bit of air, air coming through that burst disc assembly, you can take a wrench and tighten it up. But be very careful about doing this. Do not put too much pressure on that. If you break that burst disc, uh, assembly off there's a potential that the cylinder could take off like a rocket 
So just be very gentle. If you're if you're not uh, confident that you can do it without being gentle, take it to the dive shop and let them service it. So here's a here's a typical cylinder valve. And the parts that I was just talking about, we can identify the orifice. We have the neck o-ring, this big o-ring on the stem of the of the valve. The hand wheel, which we use to turn the valve on and off, the bonnet nut is actually underneath that hand wheel. So you got to actually take that plastic part off and then use a wrench to tighten down the bonnet nut, which is holding the stem of the valve in place. And then the last thing would be the burst disc assembly. You see, it looks like the head of a bolt. It's got little holes in the side of it, and you can use a wrench to tighten it down very gently. Questions? Talk to your instructor. Thank you very much.